hosting Dr. Sorry, <laughs> I'm really excited to be hosting um, Dr. Prisa Liberali today. Um, she's now a senior group leader at the um, Frederick Meischer Institute in Basel, Switzerland, and she's a faculty member at the University of Basel. She actually began her scientific career as a physical chemist um, and then moved to cell biology where she earned her PhD from the Consorzio Mario Negri Sud <laughs> in Italy. I'm trying really hard with these words. <laughs> Um, studying the role of CTBB1 in membrane fission in um, transcription. And then following her PhD, she's completed a postdoc um, in Zurich with Lucas Pelkmans, analyzing single cell variability and how it um, um, gives rise to pattern formation and multicellular variability. Right? And after a visiting scientist position with both Hans Cleavers and at Genalia, um, she has adopted intestinal organoid approaches. Um, and has provided key insights into the principles underlying how tissues can self-organize and generate patterns themselves. And um, again, I'm really excited and thank you for being here. And please um, help me welcome Dr. Liberali to Yale. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I will start sharing my screen. I hope you see it and that everything works. Yes, do you see it? Everything's fine. Yes, good. Perfect. So thank you very much for the, the introduction and the invitation. I had already a wonderful day today and I'm like looking forward to also the discussion at the end of the talk. So today I will discuss the work we have been doing in intestinal organoid development. And one of the aspects that we are mostly interested in is really what we call the design principle of multicellular system. That are really how to understand how individual cells can create higher order structure in multicellular systems. So what's the interaction and what are these properties that really emerge at the tissue scale? And the reason, and I think the challenges that uh, really are uh, with this system is that they are not constructed machines. These tissue are not put it together from the top with cells that you can just put one next to each other. There's just no blueprint of a tissue, but mainly they are built bottom up from short and long range interaction between cells. And the cells always need to maintain communication with the, the outside and the environment, sensing their environment, and then taking appropriate decision to have also processes that are robust and contextual. And so clearly, a lot of the process of genetically wired to make them precise and reproducible. However, they really need to have a very strong intrinsic space-time coordination between cells, with the individual cells that need to sense the, what's happening, but they also need to send information out and to, to create these higher order um, structures. And this self-organization that in the recent years, especially with the organoid, has been becoming clear and clear is quite intrinsic to the tissues and to make it robust and contextual. So mainly the question we have in the lab is, how is information transmitted forward into different biological scales? So how different molecules and cells can transmit information and what is the range to create and what are these emergent properties? But to also make it robust, you need to have a feedback from the tissue back to the individual cells. And there where also mechanics play a very important role where mechanics of this tissue can feedback to one, coordinate the, the system, and the second one also to make it much more robust. So to try to understand this uh, system, we wanted uh, a system where we could follow and track individual cells and was, as we called, across biological scales. So we used the intestinal epithelium. This is a monolayer of epithelial cells, as you can see here on the left. You have um, the different cell type, the stem cells in green and the panet cells in red that create the stem cell niche. These transit amplifying cells that migrate up the villus and then the enterocyte with other that are the mainly absorptive cells and some others secretory cells that are more resident in the villus. What was already shown in 2009 by Hans Klaver is that if you take one of these stem cells, an LGF5 positive cell, in up to five to six days, you can create a fully formed organoid that recapitulate, recapitulate the spatial organization of the cells, as we have stem cell niches and villus area. The cell type composition, we have most of the cell type present in the organoid and also some of the properties, so they react to different compounds in a very similar way. What was known is that this 
and a lot has been studied in this fully formed organoid. However, one of the main questions is how this individual cell, LGO5, is able to know when and where to differentiate, differentiate to create this, this structure. So how is this in vitro morphogenesis driven? The other aspect that is quite interesting and is what we call symmetry breaking is that you start from an individual cell, they divide. So these are the end of cousin cells. And when you arrive around 48 hours to 72, you have only few cells differentiating into planet cells. So this is the first event where you start from an homogeneous population, but only few cells differentiate, not all and not any, just, it's just few cells differentiate. And this is not a full random event. And so, and this is then drive the formation of the first niche. So the question is how an individual cell sends extrinsic cue to, from the environment to take individual but coordinated decisions. And what I mean about problem about biological scale, because this is a problem about biological scale, you might that both spatial and temporal scale, you might have an event that is happening at the plasma membrane of one cell. And so this is a signaling event that can be extremely fast that has consequence days later at the tissue scale. And so we need to also build ways to follow these cells at different biological scales. And so to go back a little bit on stress on the symmetry breaking, because this is one of the aspects that for us is very interesting, is how this population of genetically identical cell in the same environment, in the same uh, matrigel, in the same everything, is able to create emergent tissue level property and pattern tissue in vitro without extracellular, extracellular cues. And this goes through the formation of cell-to-cell uh, -cell variability in a population of cells. So you have this population of cells that really exhibit cell-to-cell -cell variability. Some cells have slightly different metabolic state, different amount of receptor, there are different cell cycle stages. And this gives to individual cells high probability to differentiate. And so then you can regulate the cell-to-cell -cell variability and regulating the heterogeneity at the population level allows you to control the subpopulation of cells that then will then differentiate. And in this case, I don't know where it's not moving anymore, ah, here. And so how you can see here that then some cells differentiate and this is what we call symmetry breaking, starting from in genetically identical cells that drive then the formation of a cell. And so in a way, if you look at this, and this is what we call decision-making across biological scale. So this is different cells, they start creating this population and, and then you have the different differentiated cell types. And so we have been using single cell RNA-seq that's very powerful to identify end time point cell types. Very strongly, they have a very different um, uh, profile. However, decision-making is happening here where actually cells differentiate. And so we can infer trajectories, and this is what, for example, for single cell RNA-seq is done a lot, we can infer trajectory. However, we don't know with this trajectory what is the actual cell doing, because the cells could go up and down in this part and then would be very hard to, um, to see. And the problem is that if you look at single cell RNA-seq, these cells are extremely similar. They have many genes expressed, low abundance, and their decision and the cellular state are really affected by a lot of different components that is morphogen, extracellular matrix, cell-to-cell -cell content. And the other aspect that is like, it's not only mRNA, but protein and their phenotypic cellular state that is extremely important, we believe also in the decision-making. And the other aspect that I want to be to stress is, it's not that there's an intrinsic variability. We have been looking at variability since many years in population of cells. The variability and the heterogeneity you see is not random. It's not that a cell decides to all of a sudden have much more EGF receptor. Cells that are bigger and are, have a bit more empty space have more EGF receptor than cells that are more dense and uh, crowded. On the same way, YAP nuclear translocation very strongly depend on their population. And so often this variability that we see in, um, in both 2D and 3D in tissue, these are really metastable cellular state in their environment. And then finally is that 
stemless is really a property of a population of cells. So it's a population of cell that is able to self-renew and differentiate, single cell or self-renew or differentiate. So I think that is really changing, and this is how we think a bit about this population, that it's really population of cells, and they are sensing their environment, and they're like responding accordingly to it. And so to uh, tackle this, we uh, develop different uh, technologies to try to really understand that the core is still using single cell RNA-C, but combining it also to different type of approaches, mainly image based. On one side, we look at hundred thousand of individual organoids with very high dimensional measurements. So we do multiplex, so we look at a lot of protein in different organoids. And on the other side, we look at the dynamics where we can follow individual cell for many days. So for the first part, that is the multiplexing, what we do, we take, for example, stem cells, also non-stem cells from the mouse. We make organoids and we grow for, and we can then sort individual cells. So we take stem cell, LGR5 positive cells and LGR5 negative cells, so the non-stem cells. We put them in multi-well plate and then we fix a different time point. Then we have a high content imaging where we can then visualize these organoids at very high resolution. One of the main problem with imaging is the number of readout that you can have. And also, and what we use is um, multiplex imaging protocol that is extremely easy. You can use any antibody that you have lying around in the lab that you know that works. And you just use, you stain them, then you de-stain them, and then you start again. You image and you disdain. So this is, was a protocol that was developed in Lucas Feldman's lab and published some years ago. And also in 3D works extremely well. Here, you, for example, you see a 12 plexed organoid uh, staining. So here we have 12 different staining in the same organoid. What we then do is that we image this in 3D, we segment nuclei, cells, and the full organoid. And what we have is a very complex data set where we extract a lot of features from all these different stainings and the different cells. And what we see is that we clearly have a progression over time, as expected in a time course, and, and different phenotypes. We know that there's a bifurcation where there's the organoid grow, and then you have a fully formed organoid. And we have a subpopulation of organoid where we actually don't have a panet cell. So there's no symmetry breaking. We have an organoid that actually never makes it to become a fully grown organoid. And what they become is what we call an enterocyst. It's an organoid that is only composed of enterocytes. So that means that we have a data set where the, we have distinct time points and then we have a mix of organoid because clearly this progress at different speeds. We have different phenotypes. What we actually want to have is order, order by progression. This is what single cell RNA-seq does all the time with this trajectory inference. But this trajectory inference single cells that you don't know from which organoids. While in this case, we can infer and align our organoid on the normal growth. Here you see, so we use all this imaging data. We use them to create this great graph-based trajectories to where you see that every dot here is not an individual cell, but is an individual organoid that then also has all the features from the individual cell. And we can start looking at the organoid development. What was really very useful because what we could see first is this different phenotype. As I mentioned, this you see is, for example, a full well of organoids where we have the different organoid growing. In red, you have the enterocyte, and in green, you have the LGR5 that are the stem cells. Here you see one of these enterocysts. Here's in another one. These are like they don't have a stem cell niche. And this was very useful for us to understand symmetry breaking, and we could see the balance between enterocyst and non enterocyst we see that this happens both from LGR5 positive and LGR5 negative cells. So it's not that enterocytes start to be enterocytes and they uh, become more enterocysts. These are actually the same cells that then grow and they're able to make enterocysts. But what was the most surprising aspect is that when you start growing organoids, here you see a 24 hour time point, 84 hour time point and 120 hour time point, that when you start looking at earlier time point, there's not a single LGR5 positive cell. Not from LGR5 negative, not from LGR5 positive starting population. The other thing that was quite striking is that even the LGR5 negative population would then turn on LGR5. And here you see it quantified in the trajectory. LGR5 negative positive cells, they lose LGR5, and then they reacquired 
only after day two and a half, day three. The other aspect that was also very interesting is that both LGO5 positive and LGO5 negative cells are able to form organoids. And this is really because um, what is happening, and I will just go a bit fast on this part, is that organoid formation from individual cells doesn't recapitulate an LGO5 driven process of differentiation, but is driven by a regenerative response of the individual cells, and especially a YAP1 regenerative response. So what we see is, is that indeed this regenerative response that has been shown already in vivo, that almost all cell type of the intestine are able to reprogram it after injury, and also with linear tracing experiment, they show that they can repopulate all the intestine. So both LGR5 negatives or pool, we don't know exactly which LGR5 negative population is maybe better or worse to, to make it, and the stem cells up. When they start being put in matrix gel, and in the culture for organoid development, they all reprogram. And at day one, we are really unable at this point to distinguish an organoid coming from an LGF5 positive or an LGF5 negative cell. They all look the same. They all turn on YAP. And YAP is a mechanosensor of, uh, of the HIPPO pathways. And then with the uh, co-activator, especially, for example, for T1, T4. And what we see is that YAP1 needs to be activated, and we need to have an heterogeneous YAP deactivation to drive planet cell formation. In the sense that if we activate YAP all the time, we get a lot of enterocyst. If we get deactivate YAP everywhere in every cell, we deactivate, but we always get the enterocyst. So we need an heterogeneous YAP in the state, in, in the organoid, to have the first planet cell. The other aspect that was very interesting for us is that we recapitulate a regenerative response of the intestinal epithelium. Clearly this in vivo has the immune cells and a lot of different response, but if we look at these cells and we compare it to, for example, the intestinal stem, uh, this, the intestinal regenerative cell that Jeff Ran has been looking at in vivo in the mouse, the correlation is really extremely high. So we have a system where we think also YAP serve as a sensor of tissue integrity, because then, when you dissociate the cell, the cell is upregulating the app. When the, then the tissues start to be more compact, the cells start to like have an heterogeneous uh, uh, localization of YAP. Some is nuclear, some are not. So our question was, how is then symmetry broken? How does an heterogeneous YAP is then translated into a planet cell? And in this case, we did the first single cell RNA-seq experiment where we took early time point and later time point. You see exactly here the image that I showed. So especially in the later time point, we have the planet cells, we have the enterocyte. Early time point, we have some stem cell, some planet cell, but most of them are transit amplifying like. When we look at YAP target genes, you see clearly early time point have very strong YAP target gene activation. And we have this heterogeneity with some cells expressing much more YAP than others. And so the question was, what co-correlates with the YAP target gene? What else is there that could drive? And what was clearly driving this uh, different is Delta. So we have a lot of notch sending cells. So Delta 1, Delta 4, jacket 1 and 2. And so what we then went back and look at is that if there was a correlation with the multiplex experiment, and you see here, this is an early time point. YAP is both cells always have it. There's no HES1 while already between the 62 and the 32 cell stage, we have some cells with the high YAP and some cells with the low YAP. And the cells with the high YAP have delta, delta L1 expression. And the neighboring cells that are YAP low have HES1 expression. This was very interesting because then probably what is YAP doing is then like having a slightly different expression of delta and notch, and this drive then the positive feedback to then drive the formation. So to, to part this is that we have this system where a certain point around the four cell stage, we start having the heterogeneity in YAP, and some YAP high cells give our then driving delta. And this is work in progress in the lab, because really clearly not every YAP high cell becomes delta positive. 
Every delta positive cell is YAP high, so you cannot uh, go without being YAP high, but it's really clearly a multifactorial event that is probably integrating sensing not only from the mechanical aspect, but maybe also from the metabolic identity of the cells. And so we are currently looking at, at what are the other contribution in this initial symmetry breaking and how this is coordinated at the tissue level and how then you can have the emergence of really always few planet cells that then, then start the formation of the crypt. So what I showed you until now is that organoid formation from an individual cell is an amazing assay to then start looking at one, the reprogramming of different intestinal stem cells that can then drive the formation of this regenerative tissue, clearly not in vivo, but in a way we have the power of like bottle, like the regenerative response, that's a very dynamic response. So to study it in a different way would be really hard. So where we can look at this transient and variable activation of YAP to drive notch delta activation. Clearly, there's still a lot of question on how from the notch delta we get to the planet, from the planet. So they think the open question in here are really many. But to show you some of the work we have been doing on this is really this other part on the regeneration. Because and this was also a question I had from the, the student before is like, you know, how can we model disease with organoids? The problem I have, and I think also other people have, and is, is just that we still don't know exactly what these 3D systems are recapitulating. And when we know it, it's much easier to understand which disease we can then recapitulate. And in this case, for example, we knew that there's a regenerative response of the intestinal epithelium. And so what we did, we designed a small compound screen really focused on this first days of organoid formation. And so this is the work of Ilya Lukonin, my first PhD student in the lab, crazy enough to take over this, uh, this project where what he started is like in every well, he had a, an arrayed compound screen. So this is 2,789 compounds. Many compounds target the same gene. So we target similar genes with different chemistry. We have what we call uh, uh, like smart imaging, but yeah, what we have is like a segmentation on the fly. So we take a low resolution image, every place where then we have an organoid and then we can go back, have high resolution imaging of the organoid. In this case, we didn't do any multiplexing just because Already this data set were more than 130 terabytes of imaging data. So one round of imaging, I think was more than enough. And what we stained for was aldolase B for the enterocyte and lysosome for planet cells. These are the most um, abundant differentiated cells in the, in the organoid that are also spatially segregated. We then did the segmentation and then we have this data set where we have 400,000 individual organoid and all the different features that we can acquire from the imaging data. So what we have here, we take the single cells, we organ, we amplify the organoid, we put it in pre-plated matrix gel at the compound. And this is the, the what we call the MOA box. This is a um, compound library where every compound we know the mode of action. And that's very important. So we can then go back to really look at the gene involved. This is the features. Again, we have this very big well overview and then we have the different organoids. So what we had at the beginning is this 400,000 organoid. And if you ever look at some organoid data, and I just need to laugh because it's a, you can imagine the variability you have in there. The variability that you can find in 400,000 different organoids is quite impressive. So we have this big uh, data set. And then the first question is, was already, how many phenotype actually even exist? What is the space of phenotype that we could have? And so this is how the like a UMAP of all these features extracted from these 400,000 organoid. Every dot again is an organoid color coded by area. So these are all organoids that when perturbed become much bigger. These are high aldolase B. So these are our entrances, the absence of symmetry breaking. These are like we can call panetcysts or how we want. So like really uh, over uh, production of uh, uh, panet cells. What we did, we did some different clustering and unsupervised method. And what we found is that we went from the variability of the phenotypic response 
to a phenotypic landscape, how we call it. Here we have seven main phenotypes. So this is the control. We have organoids that don't have enterocyte, but the proper shape, many panet cells. Here we have what we call a wind or keolite phenotype. So we have quite some panet cells and stem cells. Here we have organoid without the neck. So we don't have transit amplifying. This, that is my favorite, but is like, this is the regenerative one. So this is probably a YAP state. And I'll come back to this. And these are the enterocytes. Here we have the different phenotypes that are all coming because these are, let's say, the seven biological phenotypes. These are really 15 clusters that are more statistical clusters where, for example, we have different severity of the different phenotypes. For example, here we have both two enterocysts, but one is a bit bigger and one is a bit smaller. At this point, we can classify, and I'll go fast through this. It's published, and I would like if you can happy to discuss later. But then, what we do is that for every compound, we use a vector on the abundance of the different phenotype, and this allowed us from a single screen, because normally for inferring genetic interaction screen, you need to have double knockout. It's done very much in yeast. But here, having this phenotypic landscape and some work that I also uh, used and developed during my postdoc, we are able to create this first map of genetic interaction. This is also a hierarchical map here in the center. And I don't know why my mouse does not work, but um, you see the off regulator. Quite nice to see beta cathinin in there, mTOR, so it makes. Uh, but the phenotype that was the most interesting for us is what we call the regenerative phenotype. So these are compounds that, when, per when used, perturb the growth of organoid development and enrich in a YAP positive phenotype where a regenerative state is maintained longer. Then we looked at these, and two of the main aspects that we found is both the RXR and RAR. So just to summarize this part, we have this image-based screen where we can then extract the phenotypic landscape of all the different organoids. We define compounds profile. From these, we can go all the way to the target because we have multiple compounds selecting the same target. And then we can build a network using this feature vector. So to go back to the, the last part, is it the, not last part, but it's a, let's say on the, the part on the RxR is really this regenerative phenotype. The regenerative phenotype, we have this RAR and RxR. These are heterodimer driving uh, RAR E elements, and they're activated by all transretinoic acid. And so we first checked if they really work together. We looked at retinoic acid addition and uh, RxR, we see that clearly for the differentiation of enterocyte, they work together. However, what was quite striking, and here you see it, again, my mouse doesn't work, so I'll explain you the figure. So on the first part on the DMSO, you see that in some cells, you have YAP in green. On the retinoic acid, YAP is completely cytosolic, while with this RxR antagonist that clearly maintain a YAP state, you see this YAP that is very strongly nuclear in all the cells. But what is even more interesting is that if you add this RxR inhibitor uh, in normal states, you don't activate YAP. So what this compound is actually doing is inhibiting the inhibition of YAP. And this also, you will see later, is extremely powerful because as soon as you start touching YAP, you start having overproliferation of anything. But in this case, you don't activate YAP. You maintain YAP activation if YAP gets activated. That I think is a very interesting aspect and we'll use it a bit later in a few slides. And so we have also some other data. We looked at the vitamin A and the uh, retinol because clearly retinoic acid comes from, it's not made by the cell. It's like you have uptake via vitamin A and then you need to process it to make the real trans retinoic acid. And we characterize also the metabolism of vitamin A and retinoic acid, mainly in the differentiation. However, in the regenerative state is a role of RxR without RAR and probably less influenced by vitamin A. And I think this would be very interesting to see which other um, core receptor working with the RxR. It could be PPARs or other um, 
receptor nuclear receptors. One observation we had from the data that I think is quite interesting is that these regenerative cells, this YAP1 high cells, are clearly having the YAP target genes, but as many people also showed in the field, start having some fetal signature. So they start acquiring some signature of fetal uh, intestine. And they start losing CDX2. And this is also quite so they start losing intestinal identity. And so what we see, and this is very interesting because if you see in vivo, many disease, colon disease, where they have a, maybe a chronic inflammation, like some chronic Crohn disease or inflammatory bowel disease, all of a sudden start having palate cells. And normally colon doesn't have it, but this is because these regenerative cells, especially if in a chronic state, start lo stop losing intestinal identity and get anteriorized and they start to become almost more like stomach and the colon start to become more like the small intestine, getting palate cells also in places where you should not have. And here you see that also the loss of CDX2, you see it quite well in the, in the imaging data that you have uh, the loss with the RxR antagonist, you have YAP and you have much less CDX2. And then just to finish this part on the screen is that clearly is that we are saying YAP1 is not activated in the RxR inhibitor. But when YAP is activated in other ways, then it's maintained over time. And this is then what drive, drove us to like try it in vivo and what we did we looked at mouse with this RxR inhibitor and they didn't have very big phenotype, but when we injured the mouse, what we see is that RxR improved really strongly. The body weight changes after irradiation. So when you injury the, the intestine, then the regeneration goes much faster with the RxR and is also maintained. And here you can see that after irradiation, there's no villi, there's really a little goblet cells, but with the RxR, we have a much stronger maintenance of the tissue integrity and the different cell types. So for the last part, so that I showed you uh, on this part is that depending on both retinoic acid or the RxR, we can really regulate the translocation of YAP. And this translocation of YAP maintains or not, or a regenerative state or a differentiated state. So it's really seen that RxR is really at the core of this balance between regeneration and differentiation. And it's not only involved in the differentiation with the retinoic acid, but it's also a key player during the, the regeneration. And this is probably regulating the YAP translocation. And so also this is happening, and it's quite interesting. So we're also trying to look at what are the mechanisms regulating this YAP translocation regulated by RxR. And then finally, that this compound is also quite interesting because we can then look at and then uh, improve tissue regeneration with uh, very small compounds. And this is always very tricky because as soon as you start touching regeneration is really a problem also for a different uh, drug development is, you know, you don't want to activate YAP. That is, I think, baseline for anything you develop. Activating YAP is not a good thing. Maintaining it for a bit longer might be useful, but I think activating the app might be a problem. So I think this would be an interesting uh, compound that combined also with different diets with or without vitamin A could be really great to look at. So at this point, I showed you the first steps of organoid formation, the YAP regenerative state, this balance between uh, regeneration and homeostasis driven by RxR and retinoic acid. But then there's the last part that I also really wanted to present and looking forward for the discussion is about Crip morphogenesis. Actually, the intestinal organoids are the only organoid that have a proper shape. It's not true. There are also others that have decent shapes. But I think that what the intestinal organoid shows that the epithelium per se has quite a strong intrinsic capacity to bend on its own. They are able alone to form it. And so this was exactly the question that Chotan had in the lab. So Chotan is a postdoc in the lab that is uh, finishing her work and on the job market, if uh, someone is interested. Um, but it generally is what Chotan was really interested in is really the mechanical interplay during organoid formation that drive and bends an epithelium. 
So this is how an organoid forms. In red, you see the nuclei. In green, the plasma membrane. Here you see the cells are dividing, and they divide quite synchronously. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, 32. They have the basal side outside, while the apical side is in the inside. They have interkinetic nuclear migration, so the nuclei move to the apical side and then go back. When you see there's an increase of lumen formation, and after a contraction, clear contraction, you have the full budding of the crypt. So what we have at this point is, just to really focus on that moment of crypt formation, is that you have the panet cells and the stem cells. Then you have a first step of bulging, where the stem cell niche is already there, and you start having a first bulge. But then you have this contraction and really the form of the budding with the crypt villus. Here, as I said, in vivo, we know it's very different. There are a lot of processes that are not recapitulated in organoids, the different cell, there are the hinge cells, and I think there's uh, quite some work done also at uh, your institute. That, uh, but so what we were really focusing is this intrinsic capability to do it. And this is work that was published also in a back to back with a paper from Xavier Trepat and there's um, news and views from Celeste Nelson that I think is quite interesting in discussing the different aspects also on what organoids are good for or not. <laughs> and so this is how the system looks. You see in green, the stem cells that start creating the stem cell niche. You have this intermediate stage that is the bulging. And then you have the final state where you have the budding of the organ. What we use, and this is the movie I showed you before, is this light sheet long-term imaging that was developed in the lab. And it, we had the first one built in the lab. And now Viventis is a company from my two postdoc made it uh, avail commercially available where we can then have two objectives for the illumination, one for the detection, and we have a resolution from individual cell and an incubation that we can grow organoid now until three or four weeks. What we can do with this is, track single cells. We cannot track for two or three weeks. We can try here this, you know, 72 hours tracking. But what we have is this uh, multi-scale um, lineage dynamics where we can then follow every single cell and create this tree and then go back and forth from feature extracted both at the organoid level and the individual cells and then try to understand how this organoid grows and the morphogenesis of the different cells. So this is some work from Gustavo that is on bioarchive and all the code is available if, some, if someone is interested. But what Chotan was really actually very interested is really the morphological aspects. And so what she did is to measure all different possible morphological aspects, that is how the lumen, the tissue volume, and the total volume. Here you see the organoid forming, and then clearly what you have at this point is that you see the cells are triangular. So you have this apical constriction that initiates the budding. Here you see it quantified, but what we also see is that you have this apical constriction here in the bud, but you also have a bit of a compaction on the full volume here. So you see a bit of a compaction that also the basal domain of the villus domain of the villus compact. And again, as I showed you in the previous video, you have this very strong decrease in lumen volume. But the full volume of the organoid grows quite fine. So what's happening is not that the full organoid shrinks, but it's the epithelium that gets thicker. So what I showed is that we have this first niche, that that's bulge and then bud. We have crypt apical constriction and lumen volume reduction. And so to try to put together all this, we collaborated with Edward Danezo and Schle from the IST. And here we modeled the organoid in two different domains. You have the crypt region and the villus region. For every of these regions, we have both the apical, the later, lateral, and the basal um, domains that we can measure. And they are inputs in the model. And we have the height of the epithelium. Another parameter that is important and um, that you see on the left is the R, that is the radius of the two domains. So we have the villus and the crypt region, and then they could move of different radius. Epithelium can have different thickness, and then we can model the three different properties. Here, there are like three 
different models. One is differential in plane tension, like if the organoid would contract altogether. Differential spontaneous curvature, that then they curve in a different way, but that there's a boundary between the two. And so to test this, the best way is to compare the thickness ratio of the two domains. So how thick is the epithelium of the villus and the crypt and the radius ratio, because that would differentiate the three models very well. And then looking at the measurements, so we have the radiuses and the height that we measure in all the different movies, you can see here that clearly we have a differential spontaneous curvature where as soon we increase the thickness ratio, there's a decrease of the ratios of the radius. So we then wanted to measure this. How can you get this differential spontaneous curvature? Why a villus would bend differently all of a sudden than a crypt in the different ways? So first we did some measurement by laser ablation of the ap apical side of the crypt and the villus. So here we just did a laser ablation here and here. And if you see that on this side, it opens up much more than here. So this is the crypt. Oh, there are no labels, sorry. And this is the villus part. And then you can see the measure that, so the, the, the recall means that how open, how fast they open up that mean how much tension. And that's not very surprising, this apical tension. So it would have been quite surprising if all of a sudden they would be different. But what was quite nice, and here what we use is this um, macro asp aspiration pipette, so we can measure the tension on the basal side because we access it from the outside. And what we see is that the membrane on the basal side of the villus are much more on the tension. And to cut a long story short, what we see, and the reason this is happening is because you have a different localization of myosin, and this is when my mouse should work. You see here on the left image, bottom right of the left image, you have a crypt. And there, there's quite strong myosin accumulation of the apical side inside the epithelium. While on the top left of the same image, you see that myosin is accumulated on the basal side. So what you have is the different patterns of myosin drive this spontaneous curvature of the two regions, giving also different mechanical property with one more basal constriction and the other one more apical constriction. This is driven by the different cell types. So if we can make an organoid only of stem cells or only of panel cell, you see that myosin is enriched on the apical domain, while in the enterocyte that are all the enterocysts that are only formed from the enterocyte, myosin is on the outside of the organoid. So clearly there's something intrinsic first in the stem cell where you have the strongest and the pan itself, where you have the formation of these domains. So with this, what we have is a system where we have villus has a higher basal tension with the accumulation of the myosin on the basal side because of the, also the enterocyte, while the crypt that have stem cells and pan cells have this myosin apical constriction driven by myosin. Um, myosin. So going back to the model, there was one thing that was really interesting is that we made this phase diagram on the left side. So you see the X axis is normalized volume. So one is then you move back and forward with more, higher or bigger volume of the lumen. Then you have the crypt apical tension. And so increasing the apical tension, you see that the crypt that is in red close. And what this shows is that there's a critical value of apical tension at which a certain point the crypt closed and there's no way to open it up. And this is also coming back and of a very nice discussion this morning is like, how do you open a crypt both in vivo and in organoids? It's extremely challenging. Very, I think no one still has a fight because there's this critical value. And so we tested this phase diagram and I will just show you this video. So in this case, we did experiment injecting the organoid. And here we give a drug that really increased the lumen pressure really a lot. And if you see, zoop, it grows. The villus grows almost 10 times and the crypt is exactly in the same position. So past this critical value, while if we do the same inflation before this critical value, the crypt opens up. So this is uh, um, value that at which this uh, happens. Then, Finally, and just to be in time and to have some time also for the discussion, there's the lumen shrinkage. And 
I had also a discussion today on you know, what, how, what, what is this human shrinkage? And then I'll show you some of the, the work um, and then also some conclusion how, why it could be important in vivo. So here, first thing, we did exactly the same organoid as I explained you before. So only stem cells, only planet cells, only enterocyte. Planet cells and, and stem cells don't care about the volume. While the only one that really reduces volume is the enterocyst. You can see it's just completely collapsed because these are the cells that drive the, um, the, the absorption and the change in volume. We looked at what could be the case and what we looked at is like what is expressed here. You see in the single cell RNA-seq specifically in the enterocytes and specifically on the apical domain. And one of these is a sodium glucose co-transporter. And you see it here in white is on the apical side. And when we inhibit it, we inhibit the budding, but not the bulging, and it's not inflated. So we are not able. And so what is happening here, and then again, long story short, is that the glucose sodium transporter change the osmosis and the osmotic forces. And so relocalize water from inside the lumen to the enterocytes. And this is why we see also this increased thickness of the epithelium that also inhibiting this pump, we don't see anymore this increased epithelium thickness. And this could be interesting in, um, in vivo also because what we tried in the model is like, clearly the, the intestine is an open lumen. So is the change in volume of the lumen something that is controllable or in a certain way or not? But that said, crit form more or less synchronously along the intestine. So this could be a way where you coordinate crypt formation. You might not want them that they make them, they are all done at this different time. And when we can change the parameter of volume just by the thickness of the epithelium, that is actually what, and the compaction of the epithelium of the villus, that is actually what is happening. So we measured um, the thickness and the compaction of the epithelium during crypt formation that is postnatally. And indeed, Postnatally, there's the full maturation of the enterocyte that will become thicker and more compact. So this is why we think that the both mechanosmotic forces, and in this case, the osmotic doesn't change the volume of the lumen, but probably just the thickness of the epithelium and the compaction of the tissue. And it's really sulfate that as soon they start differentiating, you have both the crypt and the villus tissue. The crypt and the villus have this differential actomyosin and myosin localization that makes this differentially actomyosin and a differentially spontaneous curvature of the two domain. But this is very strongly accelerated by the villus tissue that express the membrane transporter that has the lumen shrinkage and in vivo very likely just the thickness of the epithelium to then drive crypt fracture. What is also very interesting and we have some data that are clearly that the crypt branching per se then probably drive even further maturation of the cell fate. And there is a paper that will be recently, that will come out um, uh, recently also with Matthias Lutolf, where we see that when we grow organoid in cylind uh, like round or cylindric type of organoid, the crypt are always at the bound, uh, at the, like the curved edge. So there's very likely a feedback from the morphogenesis back to the cell fate. And I think this would be a very interesting question to address. And with this, I would like to conclude and show you how I think intestinal organoid development from individual cell is a very powerful aspect to look at design principle of tissue organization, how individual cells come together, create population of cells that are able to sense their environment and respond accurately to it. And also a great system to look at regeneration and the mechanism of the very dynamical process and the mechanosmotic forces that looking at them in vivo is extremely challenging and measuring. So I think the combination of the organoid and the in vivo will be at the end the most, the, the most powerful approach. And with this, I would like to thank all the lab this set up like an organoid in here with the two red panel cells also in the crib. Especially, I would like to thank Ilya for the screen, Gustavo for the tracking, Shotan for the mechanics, and all of you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. 
Um, I'd like to first open the floor for P um, trainees to ask questions. Um, and you can raise your hand or put them in the chat. Um, and I can, Monique, I saw you raise your hand before. Hi, that was a great talk. Um, out of curiosity, do you ever see a rosette formation in your organoids? No, in the sense, not in healthy organoids. In some organoids coming from, um, uh, where, where, which model was it? It probably was a model on inflammatory bowel disease. So it was an inflammation type of model. There, um, there was not a huge phenotype, but we have this mean inclusion lumens that are probably what you would define, in, you, if you would define those rosettes, yes in this case, but in healthy condition, we really never, never saw that. So I think probably it's a problem of repolarization of tissues and uh, things. Thank you. And um, Leigh has asked a question. Um, do you see TAS changes together with YAP in parallel? Uh, I don't know. In the sense we have been looking at it, antibody is bad. And so looking at the RNA-seq is not trivial because it's also not very highly expressed. In cells, there might be something. We have been looking also at TID 1 and 4, if then it's translocated. There might be something, but hard to say at this point. And we are not following that much up on it. But uh, yeah, I think that would be an interesting aspect to see. We see more dynamics, for example, I think on the teeds, but also there, I think would be interesting to follow up and, and look at it. I can open the floor now to anyone who wants to ask questions. Oh, one more is what about phospho yap? Yes. So <laughs> yes, we have the phospho yap and then it follows. So then you have the inactive for, you know, there it's, we just have, the problem there is that we wanted to map the different phosphocytes because there are different phosphocytes that would be interesting. We tried the S147A, that is, I think, one phosphorylation site, and we also did the mutant. So we tried to knock down YAP and re express wild type or mutants to see also if they're. This was, for example, extremely toxic just to re express. Uh, so I think there would be a regulation, but I think there are different regulation um, from different phosphocytes that would be at that point. If we take the effort would, to start looking at more than one. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question. Um, <laughs> I'm really interested in this idea that CRIPS, once they reach some critical tension, can't release. And what do you think that might mean for, for example, during either developmental um, crypt fission or in pathogenic crypt fission, how that might regulate the ability to undergo fission and or the placement of the new, the new bud? Yeah, so at that point, you know, probably it would be interesting to see if the critical tension, because, you know, fission, there's like also some period where fission is just much stronger than others. And so to see if in those periods, the apical tension might be a little different. And so would be maybe even stronger because you, then you really don't want to open if you, because you're fishing from the bottom. And so I don't know if this critical um, value would, um, I could ask Edward if we could model it, like going from the bottom, because to see if this critical value would just improve the fission or not. Because like this, just thinking, I would imagine that the more you have the apical, the more, yeah, because you have the planet, so you have different cells that move. I don't know. If you have this, and, and if it's a value that only one cell type has it, because clearly both cells contribute. And so do you need different contribution from other cells? But, um, Especially with this data, right, that panacell, you sort of need a panacell, right, to undergo fission. Because you need multiple panacells in between to exactly. be able to separate them because of the inter, you know, I think there would be something. But then, and the panacells have less apical constriction. So, but maybe then the stem cell need to have more to even segregate, you know, to then, is this a combination that then what you're actually doing is not that 
because some of the model there of the planet cells is that they have a stronger adhesion with the beta with the integrins, but maybe it's just because they have less apical constriction. Mm. And so if you have a domain with stronger apical constricting here and less here, you just open it up much faster. Oh, okay. Like you're almost pulling the panacells apart or something. Uh, or the stem cells are just managing because they're all yeah. like able to se segregate more. Cool. Thank you. And there's another question in the chat. Hi, very impressive work. Um, and it's, oh, it's a two part question. Yes. How did you check for cytotoxicity during the drug screening with the number of enteroids? And then have you tried doing basal in apical out method for some drug screening or other experiments? Yes. So the first one is number of organoids. So that's clearly it's something that we had like a threshold that would make sure that we have enough organoids. We had this done in a duplicate from two independent mouses. So that was also to, uh, to try to have. Uh, clearly the problem with the compound screen is also concentration of the drug. Are you in a range where, so I think there is a lot of problem, but normally it was always with organoid numbers. So we had a threshold before less than 20 organoid, we would not consider it. Inside out, really nice question. For example, you know, nutrients, viruses, bacteria, whatever you can imagine goes into the intestine find the apical site, nutrients, vitamins. And um, yeah, so there are some protocols now to grow them inside out, but you can do them only when they're grown enough. If you try to do the, 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 the first days, there's no way they do it without metrogel. So they need a lot of very good metrogel, also very good one. They don't like bad metrogel or not enough metrogel or crappy, yeah or BME, or anything that they don't like. <laughs> so, so there we do, but then it's morally on fully formed organoids, not on this earlier one. The other way would be to use system like Matthias Lutolf says, where then you can cover them and cover the organoids. That said, uh, I think, yeah, it has to see how they grow. And, and again, probably it's more homeostasis that you can recapitulate, not a regenerative response. All right, am I missing, I often miss hands. So if anyone has a hand and you just wanna unmute yourself, please go ahead. Um, I think that, that'll do it. <laughs> oh, thank you again so much um, for a very beautiful talk. And thanks everyone, everyone for coming. <laughs> thank you.